Hi, everybody. Hope you can hear me. I'm Gwen Kavanaugh, and I'm chair of the Barry Chapter 36 for Barriers Road in the area. And I want to welcome our candidates, I want to welcome Rogers TV, and you, the audience, for being here today. I hope you get something out of this and you do not feel you're wasting your time. Here today on the stage with me is our co host, Rob Romanek from Engage Barry. Rob? Um, on behalf of the Engage Barry organization, I would like to thank the candidates and all of you for taking time out of your schedules to be here today. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, including the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Wabatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fire Confederacy. Lake Simcoe and Camelthorpe Bay are part of the Upper Canada Treaties, and the Sea of Barry is part of Treaty 16, signed in 1815, and Treaty 18, signed in 1818. As a settler, when I listen and learn of the traditional cultures of this land, I come to further value the importance of shared history, storytelling, stewardship of our lands, and cooperation among people. As we listen to our candidates, let's take time to hear their stories and listen to their intentions for the stewardship of, our, of the city we call our home. Thank you. So today, October 1st, is officially Seniors Day. So will you forgive me, I want to do a little commercial. <laughs> Last year, our chapter formed the Seniors Community Fund to assist seniors 65 and over with necessities of life if they live at or below the poverty line. The poverty line is just under 21,000 for a senior, or if you're a couple, it's just under 17,000 per person. Now, about 20% of seniors in the province of Ontario live at or below the poverty line, believe it or not, and heavy on the women. Probably because they didn't work outside the home or they babysat or whatever. But if they don't have family, they're in trouble. They're, you know, as helpless as children in some cases. So you can go to our website, barrypark.org, and across the top there are titles, and on the top right it says, Seniors Community Fund. And there's a blue box, well, there's three of them, but the first one you come to is the rules and regulations, and the last page four has an application form. You can also donate on that page. You can do a one-time donation, or you can do a monthly donation like I do. I hope you'll consider it because, well, I think we're all good people, and we really feel good when we help other people. So, um, it's right there on the website. I hope you'll have a look. Thank you for listening, and it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our moderator, Chris Simon. Chris has worked for newspapers and online publications throughout Simcoe County and the Greater Toronto area for nearly 20 years, covering municipal councils, politics, and key issues in more than 10 communities. He has written about subjects ranging from mining to COVID-19 and the BRICS. From his pen to your paper, Please welcome very advanced and simple.com journalist Chris Simon. Chris Mike McCann may be on his way. 
uh, but we've got uh, Weldon Hashey, Jerry Marshall, Alex Nuttall, and Barry Ward. Okay, so uh, with regards to the ground rules, there are none. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can you, can you tell I'm going to an Anarchy and Angus uh, wrestling show uh, later on today? So, no, no, not at all. Okay. Uh, so each candidate will be given a three-minute introduction to talk about themselves and their priorities. Uh, after that, we will uh, have a short break so that we can gather questions from the crowd. I do hope you took the opportunity to write your question down and submit it on your way in. Uh, I will then ask one question on each of the following topics that were predetermined and submitted ahead of time to the candidates. Uh, one on housing, one on youth, and one on growth. Each candidate will get two minutes to answer each of those questions um, with more time potentially uh, available, depending on how we're doing for time. Um, then we'll move into the audience question portion, and uh, I will direct um, written questions to the appropriate candidate or uh, all of the candidates if necessary. Uh, at that point, uh, each candidate will get a minute and 30 seconds for each answer. Uh, this block of time has 45 minutes available, so I'll ask as many audience questions as I can fit in. The goal is to end at 3.30, because they will boot us out of here at 4, so um, if you, uh, the 3.30 3 will allow uh, the candidates a chance to mingle and speak directly to the attendees. Um, and other than that, I think we're, uh, we're about ready to go. So we'll start um, down at the end uh, with, uh, with Weldon and uh, we'll work our way uh, along um, from right, my, my right, I guess, to, uh, to my left. Um, and then uh, for each subsequent uh, question, we'll move one down in the order. And then that way, everybody has the opportunity to uh, speak first and speak last. So um, without further ado, Weldon. Thank you. Is it okay if I stand up when I speak? Is that, will the cameras be able to catch me? Is that possible? All right, I'd rather stand when I'm speaking. I do a lot of walking. If you don't know, know me, uh, my name is Weldon Hashi. I'm also known as the Very Thong Man. I started early 2020 trying to raise awareness and wake people up as to what's going on with our government. Doug Ford said clothing was not essential, and I said, really? Well, here you go. If clothing's not essential, that's how the thong got started. So now, for those of you who don't know why I did what I did, um, for the introduction, I'd like to leave this um, opening letter. This is from a, a retired Baptist minister. His name is Walter Hoffman, one F and Hoffman. That's his joke, not mine. Um, I met Walter, I don't know if you know who James Topp is. Uh, James Topp walked across Canada. He was a, a military person 30 years, and uh, he got a dishonorable discharge for, uh, for his freedom of bodily autonomy. Anyways, I met, Walter wanted to walk with him to Ottawa, and this is a, my introduction to Walter. So Walter Hoffman's a family man and a man of a cloth. At 70, he worked out walking every day in preparation for the final legs of James Talk walk across Canada. Walter trained hard to meet James in Sudbury to accompany him on his final leg in Ottawa on foot. We went to support this loving family man and minister for standing up for a 30-year military person who served his country for his freedom of choice and was given a dishonorable discharge for non-compliance of an experimental vaccine. Walter's a well-respected, rightfully so, he with his wife Wendy and his two daughters to support him, he's a man to look up to. When we first met, I was in my thong. He was very taken aback, but smiled politely and asked that nobody take pictures with me in it. Understandably, I respected this great individual for standing up for our military and our freedoms. After we met, he inquired about me and made a point of every rally after that to personally come over and hug me and shake my hand, regardless of the thong or not. We have remained friends and always will be. Today, I am doing what I do, dealing with the doubters just trying to do what's right, spread truth for education I've received from Walter, uh, this text. He said, good for you and the freedom movement, Weldon, win or lose, you are making an impact on, and that counts for a lot. You are fighting the odds and you wouldn't be the first one to come out on top. 
You're creating a whole new image for yourself, Weldon. Keep moving in this direction. There is much more to you than people realize, and you are bringing all that to the forefront. I do believe your image as Thong Man has made an impression was relevant. What you're doing now is so much more reflective of who you truly are, Weldon. A man to be taken seriously and to be respected in your own right. All those who supported you as Thong Man will continue to have your back as Weldon, the mayoral candidate. But now you will generate many more supporters of Weldon, the candidate. It's very exciting to see some moving forward. This is where you belong, and this is where you will maximize your influence. God has a wonderful plan for your life, and I see it unfolding more and more every day as God it goes by. I bless you in Jesus' name, my friend. May the wonderful calling of God be realized in its fullest as you march forward. Do not underestimate the power of prayer as you strive towards your destiny. The glorious hand of God is upon you, Weldon. Embrace it, and I wish you every success moving forward. Love and peace, Walter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. My name is Jerry Marshall. I'm running to be your mayor. The role of mayor is one of leadership. My previous leadership roles, both in corporate and political worlds, provide me with the qualifications to lead our city. I had a tremendous telecom career. Started out as a pole climbing lineman, got promoted through the management ranks over the years to the vice president level, and as vice president, I had budgets in excess of $75 million to look after, staff complements, and greater than 650 employees. As my corporate career wound down, I became involved in local politics. I served for mayor, eight years as mayor of Panatanguishing. I served four years as Simcoe County Warden. And for those unfamiliar, as warden, I was the head of a 32-member county council. County councils comprise of 16 mayors and deputy mayors from 16 different municipalities. As a group, you're responsible for a $500 million budget and 1,850 employees. I was also the chair of the Ontario Western Wardens Caucus and a board member of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario to look after the best interests of 420 Ontario municipalities. In terms of priorities, I have three. Uh, starting out with homelessness, I have many thoughts on all these three, but with the time restrictions, I'll be quick. While there are many steps to be taken and undertaken, my first step in homelessness is one of accountability. I believe the City Council of Barrie needs to care for all of our residents, including the homeless. Currently, the County of Simcoe, and not the City of Barrie, plan, manage, and implement the homelessness portfolio in the city. This needs to change. Seniors' well-being, I have several thoughts on this, but here's two quick examples. We need to accelerate towards a community-based long-term care model, a model that would see multiple seniors residing in, or sorry, receiving the care they need while residing in a smaller residential home, a home-style setting located in a typical residential neighborhood. We need to create a housing stock that allows seniors to downsize from existing large homes to a smaller, more appropriate sized home. And I would also hold the province of Ontario accountable to install the air conditioning and long-term care facilities that they committed to. In climate change, I guess we can talk about climate change for now or all of us in this room, but uh, my thought early anyways is I believe as a city, we need to be all in on climate change. It cannot be a portfolio that is merely added as a job function to somebody else's existing portfolio. We need a subject matter expert on board Someone whose sole task is to lead the charge, to develop long-term corporate and community strategies. 30 seconds. Someone who can provide council with solid advice and present well thought out, move forward recommendations for council approval. In closing, I'm not running for something to do. I have plenty to keep you busy. I'm running to do something. I'm running to be your mayor because I have the experience, the insight, and the passion to make Barry better for my children, for my grandchildren, and for you and your families. Thank you. Alex, you're up. Thank you to CARP and Engage Barry for hosting everyone here tonight or today for this special election event. My name is Alex Nuttall and I'm asking for your vote to be mayor of the city of Barry. My family moved from England, Liverpool, England to Barry, Ontario in 1989. In 1993, my father went back to England seeking work, and from then on, I grew up in a single parent home with my mother. My two older brothers, myself, and my mother moved into Mill Creek, which is government housing in South Barry. I was 10 years old in 1996 when my mother was struck by a car walking across Wellington Street in Eccles, leaving her permanently facing both physical and mental disabilities. I grew up in a family that paid $100 a month in rent, geared to income housing, <coughs> on welfare, and subsequently on ODSP. Today, the most important question to answer for any candidate is why we're running. I'm running because the city afforded me every 
opportunity that could be imagined by a child living in poverty. I'm running to ensure that my children have a safe, clean city to grow up in, a city they can get educated in, a city they have ample job opportunities in, a city they can create a business in or invest in, and a city they can retire in. Affordability is a huge issue. Last year, my own mother identified she was having a very difficult time making ends meet. When I sold my family home, I purchased a duplex where my mother was able to have an apartment, and my own family lives as well. She was paying $1,750 a month for rent as a senior on a fixed income, the exact same number on the poverty line that was just discussed by Gwen. As mayor, I will work to get a variety of housing stock to market to address the supply and demand imbalance. Red tape can't be the ter determinant on when and if we can help people find housing, especially vulnerable people. Because of this, we will institute a 90-day turnaround for applications in the city of Erie. But affordability is not an equation that only relies on expenses. It relies on revenue and income as well. Barry has approved residential growth plans that vastly outpace our job supply. With as many as 40,000 people commuting to Toronto daily, we need to help businesses create more jobs here and more well-paying jobs at that. While Barry could have 45,000 new people living in the annexation area, our current supply of employment will likely yield 10,000 jobs. With intensification, there's another 45,000 people moving to Barry on top of that. This means we have 90,000 people coming for 10,000 jobs. I will work to get servicing of employment plans as a priority in the annexation area. This will allow Barry residents to work here, to be in their homes at 7 a.m. and having dinner with the families at 7 p.m. Finally, we need a city where people feel comfortable and safe. As mayor, I will work with the province of the North Central Correctional Facility to end the prisoner drop-off in Barry. 30 seconds. It is inhumane for the individual to be dropped off on the side of the road in a city they don't know with the belongings that they were arrested in. If these folks don't get on the bus to go home and get support, they become part of the homeless population here. And that, while it's unfair to the city of Barry, it is incredibly unfair to the individual. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I certainly look forward to the rest of the debate.
sitting there. that uh, have been pre-submitted to the candidates. Again, the, uh, I'm going to ask three questions, one on housing, one on youth, and one on growth. Uh, the candidates will get two minutes to answer each question, um, and then we'll get on to the audience questions. So the first question uh, is on housing. So, access to affordable, quality housing is a fundamental human right which affects our physical and mental health, prosperity, and community. The City of Barrie's Housing Affordability Task Force Report, Final Report, has given us a blueprint of how to tackle the housing crisis. Which of these recommendations would you prioritize candidates? Uh, how do you intend to support housing development in a way that addresses the needs of all income levels, abilities, ages, and stages, while also being environmentally responsible and working towards more diverse, integrated community building. So we're gonna move one down this time, and we're gonna start with Jerry, so whenever you're ready, Jerry. You fooled me, I was going for uh, question number two. Um, so on housing, uh, in my mind, we need to leverage existing facilities. If you look around the city, you see the provincial, municipal, and federal buildings, and they're all one and two stories tall. Why do we not have a third, fourth, and fifth floor in those facilities 
that accommodate residential apartments and create more housing stocks. So we need to look at opportunities like that. Uh, we also need to complete a land inventory. So the city of Barrie, like any other city, has a lot of un vacant land unused. So can that land be turned over into some kind of housing opportunity? So we want to have a look at those opportunities. Zoning. I hear it all across the provinces I pay attention. Everybody talks about tiny homes and tiny communities. No council puts a bylaw in place that actually makes that happen. So we have to stop talking about those ideas and actually come up with a bylaw that creates the on ramp, on -ramp to make that a successful opportunity. I'd also uh, champion the building of homes for heroes. That's a great project. I'm familiar with the one in Kingston. I think it'd be an ideal fit here in Barrie and certainly something that I would pursue uh, vigorously to get into our city. I also I was proud to be a part of the creation of Lucy's Place, was the old uh, bars motel that got turned into uh, uh, housing for our artists to house. And so I want to see more of those opportunities taken advantage of. So do we have uh, facilities, and maybe abandoned facilities, motels that could be retrofitted into creating more housing stock? We need to look at those as well. And if the housing is an essential part of our uh, life, we need to give it a preferred approval route. We need to get uh, approval through this system much quicker than we do today. We need to move it at a very, very rapid pace that we're not currently doing. And finally, we need to get the bureaucracy out of the way. Simply, it takes far too long to plan and approve housing, and red tape delays for home builders, for renovators, and homeowners looking to improve means extra cost on the final end user, the end the final purchase. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that, uh, for that answer. I think there was some great insight in there. Uh, you know, I have a unique perspective uh, growing up in affordable housing, and uh, you know, over time, I I can honestly tell you. I've that um, where we were in terms of rent geared to income was, was kind of one stop away from either a shelter or homelessness. And uh, I think that uh, that unique perspective I'm able to bring to the table uh, and the empathy with it will serve both uh, the city as well as uh, people who are facing uh, these circumstances very well. Affordable housing, uh, it's a continuum. It ranges from home ownership to rental, transitional housing, supportive housing, and emergency shelters. We need a strategy that will address all of these types of housing and for all citizens of Barrie. As mayor, I will work to remove barriers and roadblocks for affordable developments like Coral on Bayfield Street that's been there for six years and still not built, or what's currently being looked at proposed at Mapleview Church. When people come to Barrie with ideas, we need to ask how we can get it done. I support the recommendations in the Housing Affordability Task Force report, but we need action to actually get these recommendations done. Many of these were outlined in the 2015 Build Form Task Force report, but we haven't seen a lot of progress on them yet. I'll waive DCs and permit fees on all affordable units in Barrie, commence with a 90-day turnaround time, and prioritize developments that bring affordable housing stock to market right here in Barrie. And one of the things that I think in the long term, as we look at housing, and, afford and certainly affordable housing, is breaking the cycle of poverty. And one of the items that I've always loved working on is high education, which helps provide tools children in government housing throughout the city and actually throughout the county so that they can have the tools to be successful in school and hopefully chart a beautiful path forward. Thank you. Um, affordable housing is good for our health and it's also good for our economy. In other words, it is good for our community. Uh, we don't need any more studies. I agree with everybody, although we should always be open to new ideas. Uh, we have started as a council to implement the recommendations of our housing
and that's expensive. Um, finally, the last thing I want to say was, as mayor, you're only one vote. You can only do, you do so much. You can treat, you know, try to work these things. But the thing, the most important job for me is, as a mayor, when you say somebody comes in with an affordable housing proposal, I would say, how can the city help you? How can I help you? And it's not just talk. When, uh, when the, uh, Redwood Park communities and Savage Army want to build transitional housing behind here, the first thing I said was, let's make it happen. How can we make it happen? Um, there will always be neighborhood opposition. It's important that we don't listen to the old opponents who don't want to build. You can take it into consideration. In that case, we did things such as moving it back a bit. We did the eliminate the second drive, which would have to the homes. The most important thing the mayor can do is when somebody comes with a support housing idea, back it and help them get it going. Thank you. Go for it, Walter. I'm in the uh, sheet metal business, heating and air conditioning, so construction is a very big part of my background, and part of that is keeping up on the innovations, inundations of construction and building. Now, there are countries around the world that have processes. They can build houses in a matter of days, weeks. They're building entire apartment buildings. Uh, one of the things Jerry mentioned was going up on top of these other ones. That, that, that's a great solution. We just have to be careful that building is going to uh, support that excess weight when they have to build brand new and go up. I also believe that, that if we look into these technologies, it's a fast solution for building quick homes. Uh, the zoning bylaws have been changing to help because of the shortage of housing. We are now allowing one or more dwellings on a property. This is where the tiny homes may come in. I've been looking at tiny homes for a long time, I'm thinking about getting into that business. Now, that's kind of going into homeless and, and, and you know finding emergency shelters. We could build small, tiny homes at a very quick pace just to alleviate these people from being out in the, in the harsh elements. And, and give them some little safe, safe haven for them to crawl into at night, getting into the weather, you know, portable ones, getting them in, in someplace safe. We can do this for, for the elderly, the tiny homes, people that are in larger homes, you know, it's very hard on the elderly to keep it up. I know it's a family home, and if, if, if they're 90 years old, 80 years old, it's difficult to look after that large property. So it might look into an investment to, to put them into a smaller home, something more comfortable, maybe into a, a, a whole subdivision where elderly can, can look after themselves and we can, you know, condone or contain in smaller homes and, and, and help allow them to live safer instead of climbing up and down stairs. Uh, tiny homes, I think, is a, is a way to look at things and, uh, and the construction industry needs to grow faster, needs to keep up with technology. It's there. Okay, uh, on to the uh, question about youth, and Alex, you're going to be uh, getting the first go at this one. What plans do you have for attracting and retaining more young people to and in our city, including plans for ensuring a more inclusive, vibrant, and sustainable environment for them? How will you attract the quality and well-paying employment opportunities to give them a more secure future? And what programs and services can the city provide to them to build their skills and support young entrepreneurship? Um, and by young people, we are specifically referring to uh, people in their late teens, their 20s, and their early 30s. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Young people are looking for a complete community with a great uh, quality of life. They're looking for a city where they can live, they can work, and they can play. They aren't looking for a city that they can sleep in and enjoy like a cottage on weekends. It is so important that we write the balance between residential and employment growth over the next 10 years. 40,000 people on the highway, weekdays commuting. 45,000 people moving to the annexation area. 45,000 people coming through intensification. Enough employment land for 10,000 jobs, this isn't adding up. Young people don't move somewhere so that they can drive somewhere else every day. As mayor, I'll work with Georgia College and the provincial government to expand university programs here in Barrie. I'll work with organizations like Sandbox to develop local talent and attract talent to our city and our downtown. We have a huge market of talented folks that are driving to the GTA every single day. I'll work with local employers to entice those folks to stay home right here in the city of Barrie and work their vocation. I'll showcase how valuable Barrie is as a hub for business with an airport seven miles to the north, a rail line that can get anywhere in North America, and 400 series highway to move people and goods around. In short, if we have the opportunity for young people to thrive in their chosen vocations, they will choose Barrie. They'll choose Barrie to experience 
our incredible waterfront, our proximity to the hills, and our thriving community. Thank you. Um, I've already talked about affordable housing, and that is, for me, without a doubt, a key to attracting and retaining more young people in Barrie. No matter how attractive we make this city, they aren't going to stick around if they can't afford to live here. As part of my economic platform, I've said that my focus will be on helping existing businesses Create conditions where local entrepreneurs, not necessarily young, but many of them, or most of them will be, are encouraged to fulfill their dreams. The city's economic development program has, the department has numerous programs aimed at young entrepreneurs. That is the focus of the Sandbox Business Incubator and the city's board of small business center. I think we also need a strong and healthy downtown because that is the place many young people want to be. My experience has been that they are the ones investing in their downtown already, both on the main street and the second story offices above. Uh, we need a city hall that reflects the diversity of our community, and uh, we need citizen committees that reflect all demographics. Um, personally, I'm always willing to, uh, I think, I'd like to say a strength of mine is that I'm always willing to learn. I was appointed chair of the uh, city's uh, task force to create a marketplace where the bus terminal moves, and I really took care of putting together my committee. I was given carte blanche to create my committee. I took really care, I looked at various people, and I tried to have, have a gender diversity and diversity of backgrounds. But I know the first time we met, I suddenly realized I didn't have any young people on the committee. It was kind of a, an, an eye opener. I really realized I should have paid more attention. Luckily, we had two young people in the community who kind of forced their way on the committee. We started showing up at meetings, started attending everything that we did, and eventually I ended up putting them on the committee. And it turned out they were two of the best people we had on the committee. And these guys. So I'm not afraid to say that even I'm willing to learn. At my age, I'm still willing to learn that we need to include young people in everything the city hall does. If we want to get city young people to buy in, we should be included. two jobs, 40, 60 hours a week, barely able to make their rent and, and pay for groceries. We, we need this open and available to everybody, not just our youth. We, we need to teach and, and, and educate people on how to be self-sustainable. We need to have these implementations uh, to help everybody. At, and working evenings is how I worked, or I worked during the day and went to school for evenings. Every Tuesday, Thursday, or every Monday, Wednesday. For 20 years, I put myself through education at night. Raised my son, my son as a single father. It was difficult. We need to make it more accessible. Not everybody can do that. I was traveling from Keswick every day to Toronto doing the commuting. We need to make things available and accessible here locally in Barrie. We need to have these schools and institutions in place with teaching staff who are coaches, who are entrepreneurs themselves, to teach the valuable lessons needed to open up businesses and come up with brilliant ideas on how to make our city a better place. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think we need to uh, survey an existing youth. So why are they here? What do they like? What is, it, what is, what is missing? Or what do they need? We need to understand from our current youth that live in Barrie, what, what is it all about? Why are they here? What do they want? What do they need? And we need to address housing. House, youth start out in life making less money in the early days of their career. We need a housing stock that will give them a chance to weather the storm until they get to those higher income levels. It ties back to my smaller homes for downsizing seniors. Those same homes are entry homes for youth entering the housing market. Social interaction are critical to the youth and we need places where they can enjoy life without having to spend a fortune. We need to create a vibrant downtown as a destination place to go and be. We need to ensure that we are inclusive, welcoming our BIPOC, LGBTQT, and new immigrant communities. And we need to embrace all the things that make us so wonderfully diverse. We need to leverage assets such as the Henry Burnick and Sandbox Centers. We need to be active and aggressive in economic development. We need to ensure our city's value proposition is current and positioned in a manner that best attracts business. And you know, we had a great tagline, it was uh, well connected. And Barrie is well connected. We have Lake Simcoe Airport, 10 minutes up the road, Highway 400 series right here at the doorstep, 45 minutes to an international airport. Within a one hour drive, we have a marketplace of 9 million people. Within an eight hour drive, we have a marketplace of 36 million people. We are a great spot to open doors and drive business. And finally, we need to embrace economic drivers, sorry. 
You're good. 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 you are good 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 you
Let's take their money and use it to make Barry a better place and use their money to, to, to build our infrastructure. Go for it, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the largest challenges facing our city is growth. It impacts us in every way. Traffic on roads, noise, sprawl, rising home prices, effects in Lake Simcoe, and increased taxation. To me, we need to look out 20 or 30 years to determine the needs, look, and feel of our city. Then we need to set short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. With those goals, we need to set targets and milestone date and accomplishments. I work with Council early in this term to identify where we need to be and put in place the on-ramps required so that our future can easily come on board. As we grow, we will grow in all areas. We will have some arrive with good health and financial stability, while others will arrive with being at risk of being homeless, some will face addiction and mental health challenges. We need to have a full 360 degree view of growth to be prepared for all that is coming, that is coming our way. Similar to the needs of youth, we need to ensure that we are inclusive and welcoming to different cultures, different religions, our BIPOC, LGBTQ2, LGBTQT, and new immigrant communities, and we need to embrace all things that make us so wonderfully diverse. As a city, we need to plan, build, own, and operate and combine affordable housing including units dedicated to the hardest to house. The net result is being a housing model that will increase the supply of at-market affordable and special needs housing, all of which need to be located in good locations. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, like to, uh, to answer the second part of the question first. And as you can tell, we are, um, dare I say, three, uh, three middle-aged white men and a probably a younger white man standing on stage and sitting on stage. And so I think it's really important that uh, we do everything we can to include as many people in this process, in the electoral process, but also uh, in, uh, as Barry stated after, in terms of our committees and the makeup of our city. I can tell you I have members of uh, the Sikh community, Hindu community, Persian community, Muslim community on my campaign. My campaign manager, CFO, and director of communications are all incredibly talented uh, uh, individuals whose leadership and advice I take daily. They are all uh, women. I will bring the outlooks of these individuals and communities to the Office of Mayor and work to improve daily on ensuring that our city, and specifically our city hall, is a wel welcoming place for all. In terms of growth, I mean, the reality is the growth doesn't pay for growth. We've been saying that for many, many years. And then after that, we go and approve more growth. So we know that the equation doesn't work. We know there's a deficit every time we build a home. <coughs> And yet we keep going down the same path. We need to focus on ensuring that we bring to Barry jobs. And I know I keep saying it, it sounds repetitive. The reality is the more jobs we bring to Barry, the more employment uh, that comes here, the more uh, buildings we build, they offset the cost of our residential taxes. You know, one opportunity I see in the city of Barry in our current, in our current uh, capital plan is the Southeast Recreation Center. It costs over $100 million. Every night and weekend, we have schools sitting there with gymnasiums that are not being used. One of the things I'd like to do is work with our school boards to open those up, open up for sports, arts, mentorship, especially in places where we have vulnerable communities. We can save money and we can also create a great community atmosphere going forward. Okay, uh, that is uh, it for the submitted questions so thank you very much candidates for uh, for answering those with such depth um, now we'll uh, do some uh, some audience questions So this round we've got 45 minutes, although we're having so much fun, maybe we'll go a little bit longer, who knows. Rogers, you're okay with that? Um, okay. So, uh, first question, and a reminder that each candidate will have a minute 30 seconds to answer this, unless it is directed at one candidate specifically, and then it'll just be that who gets the minute 30 seconds. Okay, so first question is on 
long-term care. What new services will you, as our mayor, provide? And I don't understand the preamble, so I'm going to skip it. So, uh, this is, I guess it would be, Weldon would, uh, would go first on this one. I'm afraid of that. <laughs> Sorry about your luck. That, that is a great question. Um, I'm kind of stumped on it. I, I'd have to put some thought into it. I, I mean, you know, we have uh, an aging population that needs to be taken care of. Uh, the, the nursing homes. I've had a friend who works in the nursing home industry. She runs 13 different nursing homes. And uh, so I was very in tune with what was going on, especially in the last couple of years with this pandemic. Um, I, I got involved in doing what I'm doing, and, and, you know, protesting because of a girl that is from a long-term nursing facility. She's the youngest in actually at all of Canada. Uh, she broke her back, she's a native lady, and, and she broke her spinal cord. She's in a long-term facility in Scarborough. And when this hit, she, uh, she was a prisoner in her own home, in her own room. They would put the food on the floor in the hallway and knock. Uh, she wasn't allowed to go out, she wasn't allowed to see anybody due to, due to safety concerns over COVID. Um, my father was in the nursing home, he was put into palliative care. And, and he, he, he was almost dying. They put him on morphine, and, and I said, we gotta get him off of morphine, he had atrophy. They said, it, you know, because of the pain, he needed exercise. So I hired a, a nurse seven days a week, well, five days and one, two days a week to come in because they didn't have any way to look after him and alleviate his pain other than giving him morphine and, and rolling him over once in a while. But we definitely need to look into this, and uh, I need to dig deeper and find out from the elderly and from these nursing homes what it is best that we can serve them, and, and I need to know. I, I can't answer that question until I dig deep, and I'm, I'm truly uh, interested in finding more out and helping as many people as I can, so that's, that's my best answer. Certainly a couple things come to mind. So one is multi-generational homes. So right now we still continue to build homes for single families. We see, you know, we drive down the street and we see three or four or five cars in the driveway. You know the house has multi-generational families living within that facility. So we need to create zoning and, and build homes that are actually multi-generational so that the, the seniors living in that home can be cared for by their children and their grandchildren. So it creates that environment that actually drives down costs for everybody because now you've got three families sharing in the cost of that home. We've got better health care, we've got better child care, you have less babysitting costs and you're sharing hydro bills and a few other things that make life a little bit more comfortable for you. So certainly I want to look at that. I mentioned in my uh, earlier uh, uh, point, was really you know, long-term care facilities that look like residential units. So it's a typical house. It'll look like any other house in the neighborhood. The inside, of course, will be different. It needs to be accommodating for seniors that need different uh, amenities, such as uh, you know, the washroom facilities and handheld grips and, and that type of undertaking, as well as a place for you know, nursing and uh, PSWs used to have a spot to care and treat and uh, look after our residents. And then they're in a nice neighborhood where they feel comfortable, feel enjoyable. When they go for a stroll, you know, they're with everybody else. And that makes a huge difference when you feel like you're part of something, you know, because we've got to get out of this warehousing our seniors into these long-term care facilities are just simply square boxes. We've got to be better than that. And finally, look at the uh, County of Simcoe to invest more into our area for uh, uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, they seem to be building around us, but not with us. and so. Again, in that growth that we talked about before, we got to be working with the federal, the provincial governments, and the county simple so that those long-term care uh, care facilities are part of our future plans. So that we have them prepared. So as we grow, they're ready to uh, accommodate the growth long-term care residents and seniors will come with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. And um, you know, I, I want to start where, where Jerry just left off. The reality is the City of Mary, uh, through your taxation, uh, transfers dollars to the County of Simcoe. And while we have folks at the, the Health Services, Human Services, the Bay Area, I believe you're, you're one of them, uh, we have no votes on County Council. And the reality is, that means we don't have an accountability of those funds here in the City of Mary. So the question is, well, what happens and how much money are we spending? Now I'm going to go on memory here to over eight, eight years ago, and I'm sure Barry will be able to update you after me. I remember it being somewhere around 200,000 a bed that we were paying to the County of Simcoe. We had 12 beds, I believe, in the city of Barrie at the time. Uh, I don't believe that that's uh, had any substantial increase over the last number of years. We need to figure out a system here in the city of Barrie that works for the city of Barrie, because right now it works for the county and it doesn't work for the city. 
So as we're talking about long-term care beds, which was what the question was, the answer is writing the funding model here and ensuring the investment happens here in the city of Barrie. And that's gonna take some very hard work uh, between the city and the county, uh, but even more so with the province of Ontario, uh, who is the, the parent, if you will, for all counties and all municipalities. And I'm gonna go to work on that because it is incredibly important for our community that we get the funding model uh, put in place that actually allows very money to fund very beds. Um, I actually agree with uh, Alex on this point because it is true. We have, as a city, we are required to provide a long-term care home, and it is provided through the county. They are our long-term care home provider, and we are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars a year for less than a dozen very residents that are in long-term care uh, because they're in the homes are in Collingwood. They're During the last term of council, I introduced a motion at council to have staff investigate whether we could declare um, Victoria Village as our long-term care home. Victoria Village has been granted, I think, 124 more beds or some number like that. Um, we own it. We own Victoria Village. It should be our long-term care home. So I know that's going to become a legal matter, but I think it's very important that we we get our money to go to Victoria Village, not to the county care homes around the around the rest of the area. It may not save us money. At the end of the day, we may end up paying more, but at least we'll be providing beds for very residents. So I think it's very important. The other thing we can do as mayor, something I would do as a councillor, is meet with people who are proposing to build long-term care facilities. Chilego Villages, which owns Coleman Health Care Centre just down the road, is looking for a new location because they've been granted more than 100 new beds. And uh, I've been working with them with staff to find a new location. They've actually found one, but I don't think they've announced it yet, so I don't want to say what it is. But so that's the kind of thing as a mayor you can do, work with the people who are proposing to build long-term
So I think it's a really important asset for the city of Barrie, and I'll certainly, uh, you know, endorse that uh, going forward. I, I don't foresee any uh, want in terms of uh, a loss of service to be able to do. perception of an aggressive police force? Okay, um, perception of an aggressive police force. So I guess one of the things I'd like to see is a lot more community involvement by the police. I think we're on that path. We, you know, we have a community safety and well-being committee that works with this. This is a, a good uh, working relationship with them because I worked with them when the, uh, the travel lodge was being used as temporary shelter and there was, uh, unfortunately, a skyrocketing number of incidents in the area, shoplifting, that kind of thing that was bothering the businesses, uh, a lot of drug use. Uh, 
Um, and I worked with the Community Safety and Wellbeing Committee, and I was very impressed. They were out there, they came and spoke to all the businesses, they talked to the Busby Center, they talked to E-Cry Center. I was impressed by their, their approach. And we had three meetings, and by the third meeting, the businesses on Mayfield Street were full of praise for the police, for the, ad, for the approach they'd taken. It's not an aggressive approach. It was an approach of working with the people, working with the, uh, the homeless, and working with the business owners, working with the service providers, to figure out ways to solve the problem. And that's the kind of thing I think we need to see in police. I think if we have police, for example, walking around downtown and talking to business owners, talking to the people that are causing problems downtown, it will do wonders. So I hope I'm answering your question, but I believe in getting the community, getting the police out of the community and working with the groups. Thank you. Well, this is a question I've got uh, a lot of experience with um, because you all know I'm protesting a lot, uh, protesting my Charter of Rights, Mozilla Rights, so I'm out at all these freedom rallies, I see a lot of interaction between the protesters and the police, I was in Ottawa, I have been arrested a few times, peacefully protesting, still getting arrested for exercising my Bill of Rights. Recently was up in Aurelia and I was thrown in the back of a police car for protesting, a bunch of mothers and grandmothers asked me to come up because they were uncomfortable with six month old babies getting an experimental vaccine. I was peacefully protesting, I was thrown in the back of a cruiser with no air conditioning, the doors and windows were closed and it was about 30 degrees out that day. I almost passed out from hyperventilation. Despite all that, I keep telling all my protesting family, freedom family members, don't yell and scream at the police. You keep yelling obscenities at them and you're only gonna provoke them and, and make them think worse things about you. When push comes to shove, if they think you hate them, they're gonna come back at you. They're only doing their job. Their job has been implemented by policies that are in position by those in power. Those, those police officers are just doing their jobs. They're family members. They got you know children at home, they got mortgages to pay. There is a bad perception about the police officers, and like every culture, every race, every every religion, there's good and bad. So the police officers, they're working together with us. We need to work to more with them and help them as much as they need to help us. It's, it's, it goes both ways. Well, certainly, I think you know, what we need to do is get our police officers out of the vehicles, and we get we need to get to know them. I truly believe that because I've had that experience. Uh, you know, so we you have a couple of officers walking down your downtown streets. Your merchants get to know them. Uh, those homeless uh, uh, residents that are downtown in the downtown core get to know the police officers on a first name basis. Uh, the uh, merchants, sorry, the residents are shopping downtown get to know the officers, and it changes the environment. And I've seen it happen. You know, uh, my wife and I ran two uh, stores uh, on main streets in two small towns, and one had a community street team run by the uh, local health unit, and it made a huge difference. Everybody was more comfortable. The environment changed. It was friendly. It was more welcoming. It was less daunting. And everybody was happy. The three groups that really were happy were the, those who were homeless, the merchants, and those who wanted to shop downtown. So you need to change that environment and introduce your police officers into the community. And so we need them on the street, and I don't see that as an extra expense. I see that as an investment in our community. So if that costs us a couple more dollars in our police budget to get our officers on the streets, we need to invest in that. It's an investment, it's not a spend. Also, yeah, I've seen you know officers on bike trails, so they're on the bikes, they're going down the pathways, they're going down the trails, they're talking to people, they're talking to residents, and there's a knowledge and intimacy there that develops, and everybody's more comfortable. So part of the problem we have right now is everybody seems to shy away from having our police officers engage and be part of our community. I see it the opposite way. Let's encourage our officers and fund our police force so they are part of our community and we all feel better, much better about it. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question. This is for all of you. So that means Barry is going to get to go first. And I love a good preamble. The outgoing council declared a climate emergency in 2019, and um, uh, the City of Barrie community uh, greenhouse gas plan was also passed. Um, not much has been done on that. Uh, what can a municipal municipal government do to affect change? Um, I'm not sure if I agree that not much has been done. It's a long-term plan, and uh, we do have plans. I mean, the things we can do is a municipality is the same thing as people can do as an individual. Um, we are going to, we are electrifying our fleet. I think it means buses and other um, vehicles, parks, vehicles, etc. We've um, our, our plan is about mitigating the effects of climate change as well. So that's part of it, but a lot of it is, is finding ways for the city to reduce emissions, making our, when we build a new facility, make sure it's built to the standards that um, emissions are reduced. Um, I, so I think there's a lot of 
about things that we can do as a city and as individuals to encourage our individuals. One of the things that we can do is encourage the people as um, the educated public of what they can be doing to help as well. Um, yeah, so I think sort of the, the premise of the question that we're not doing anything is wrong. I think we are doing a lot as a city. We can certainly do more, but um, uh, it's probably the number one issue that's going to face our future generations that are seen around with climate change uh, that I think we have to address it seriously. set some ambitious goals with uh, progress reports that are measurable and identifiable and accountable. Uh, we need to make our decisions with green technology in mind, including greener public transit in our vehicles, and dedicated staff, as I mentioned before, focused on climate change initiatives. And we need some of our staff looking like five years up, came from an industry where we had a department and their only job was to think about tomorrow. They didn't think about today. Where's the marketplace five years from now? What technologies do we need to make a successful business? What do our, our customers, in that case, need or require? Where's the market going? And I can tell you, oftentimes people, geez, how did they come up with that? Well, we didn't just wake up one morning with that plan. We had somebody dedicated to look into the future needs and where the marketplace was going and how we could get there. So if you look at that new wave technology out in Toronto, uh, they're cooling uh, uh, apartment complexes with water from Lake Ontario. And so they're replacing you know, hydro-generated air conditioning with water cooling from Lake Ontario. We need people looking at those types opportunities for the city of Barrie because we're growing and we're growing quickly. So you have to have a look at that. The other thing I looked at was looking at one of the reports the other day, and one of the things we should be proud of the city is, you know, our organics, so our food waste, we get about 70% of our, our organics are going in the right spot. And that's pretty impressive, that's really well. But the challenge is, the 30% that's not going in represents three and a half million tons of food that are still in our waste stream. So we have to set a target to zero uh, or get or zero food in our waste stream. We have to set a target and manage to that target. Uh, so really, you know, I'd like to start, uh, food is not garbage campaign. Make it simple, make it clear, food is not garbage. And our school systems are problematic because our children go to school, of course the schools don't want the organics, so they take the food home so the children don't see your this recyclable opportunity. You're way over. <laughs> were, were you yelling? <laughs> but I was on the <laughs> I 
served as was the chair of ACDC. It was the Aldell Community Development Corporation, not the band. And what we did was we signed a deal with the city and on behalf of the city with the, with the uh, Metrolinks to bring the secondary train <coughs> station to Barrie. That's one side of it. We have 40,000 vehicles worth of carbon going to Toronto every single day. That is a huge number, and it's only going to get worse. We want to have an impact as a city. I don't want to see more highways. Even the GO train, it's great to be able to move people, but if we have them working here, we're preventing those emissions from ever happening. And finally, I want to make sure that we can partner with a cap and trade company, because as we make these changes and as we make progress, we can then sell all of the emissions that we've held, everything that we've captured, to uh, other companies and actually turn our environmental standards into a revenue generator for the city of Barrie. That's the future for us. Okay, um, next question, because this person clearly has not read Simcoe.com lately. Uh, do, it's about safe injection sites. Uh, do you understand what is delaying the opening of the site at uh, 11 NSL Street in Barrie. And we're starting with, well, I've been asked about that. I, I think we're gonna get to the root of the problems. Safe injection sites? I'd like to keep everybody safe, especially our homeless, our vulnerable drug addicts, but why are they drug addicts? Because they've got no hope, no future. They've got nothing to look forward to. They, they've lost everything. And society, to them, has turned their backs on them. Now you're gonna give them a, a safe injection site? Why don't, why don't you just offer them the, the, the you know, the, the, the uh, suicide, a doctor-assisted suicide? I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna inject themselves uh, till when, till they die? Safe, what's safe about injecting? You're just getting them out of sight, out of mind, put them somewhere else, we don't have to see them? You don't wanna see them on the streets? We gotta look after these people. I want them safe, but we gotta look after them as well as everybody else in this city, but safe injection sites, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think we need to look after them and, and try and get them off of drugs. And it's the biggest thing than just a safe injection site. So the question I think was, do I know what's holding it up at uh, Queen's Park and I don't have a clue? Uh, that's up at their level and we'll have to pursue that uh, when we come into play. But I think, uh, you know, the Weldon's gone off to the right topic. So what is a safe uh, consumption site? Do I believe in it? And the answer to the question is yes. And why? It's simple. It saves lives. That simple to me. And so what we need to do is we'll have a look at the site there in 11 Newsville Street, and I understand the residents' concerns, I really, really do. And what I want the government to do is answer their questions before that site opens. What are the hours of operation? How you protect the children? What will happen to uh, uh, our resident who's injected at that site after the injection? Those are fair questions that need to be answered, and they're unanswered at this point. So I certainly want to answer those questions and understand them. I also look at a little broader perspective as the fact of the matter is that, you know, it's been all over the city, very door knocking as everybody on this uh, stage has. And our, we have an addiction problem in all 10 wards. It is there in every ward. So in a safe injection site, is someone from Ward 10 going to travel all the way to downtown Barry uh, to uh, get an injection? The answer to that question is probably no. So I'd like to look at a mobile safe injection site. If we could do it for COVID needles, if you give us needles to help us through that COVID crisis, why can we not have a mobile safe injection site or a unit that arrives at your house, protects your privacy, and looks after your needs? Thank you. I believe the, uh, the question was uh, related to why do I know what's holding up that the answer to that is, is no. Um, you know, I think that uh, this is something that falls under the provincial jurisdiction in terms of the approval, uh, sorry, something that falls under the uh, provincial jurisdiction in terms of the approval process. Uh, I will wait and see uh, where that uh, where that lands, and uh, and then go from there. In terms of uh, services in the city of Barrie, you know, uh, there's a 705 which is opened up on Dunlop Street. There uh, is Cornerstone which has recently opened up, and I think that there are strides being made in the right direction here. Uh, there are strides being made in the sense that uh, I believe the rehabilitative services uh, are uh, the end game for folks uh, who are experiencing addictions, and you know, there are holes that exist our system. And I'll give you an example. I, I, uh, I know somebody who uh, is a very dear friend of mine uh, who's uh, experiencing uh, issues with addiction and uh, having that person uh, go to detox is a very difficult thing to do because it's so busy. We just don't have the capacity. We have a moment in time, a moment in time where that can happen. And so I really think that we need to invest uh, in both rehabilitation 
uh, in ensuring that there's a uh, availability in detox and, and, and other services, rapid services. Uh, and I think that if we have a 360 look at this, I think it will really help our city and more importantly, it will change some, some pretty incredible lives that are suffering right now. Um, as we've heard, the, the question was what's happened with the uh, safe consumption site? Uh, and it's basically, it's for the province. The province is a local initiative to establish the site, but it's the province that will have to fund it. The province has not come through with funding. I led the application of very um, councillors to meet with uh, the health minister, Sylvia Jones, in August to ask her, among other issues, ask her what was happening with it, and we got no commitment whatsoever, so I don't know what's happening. Uh, there is a possibility the federal government can only step in and provide funding. I haven't seen any indication that's happening as well. I'm a supporter of the safe consumption site. I, I leave those kind of decisions to the experts, and the expert says it's part of, it's one of the pillars in a multi-pronged approach to dealing with our opioid crisis, which is killing people. save lives, it won't save all the lives, and it's not the only solution, but it's part of the overall solution, and it's very necessary. Um, I find it bizarre that council was even asked what was going to be located. We don't get asked about anything else but when the province locates something. Why they asked us for our approval, I do not understand. Um, but they picked the site, and I think the sooner we get it up, the sooner some lives. Do you have something you want to add? Yeah, I know this is what we're going to have. Just one more thing to add. A friend of mine's son has been struggling with addiction, and he's going down, he was going down to the methadone clinic. He found out a product called Supplicate, and, and Supplicate is a, is a wonderful drug. He calls it a miracle drug. He's been addicted. He's been cracking needles for over 10 years now. He's finally clean after Supplicate. There, there's a lot of questions to be asked. We need to look into it. We need to talk to the doctors. We need to talk to the pharmacists. But Supplicate, they don't tell you about it. They keep selling this methadone, it's coming out of our taxpayers' dollars. There's a lot of money being wasted that could be reallocated and properly used using drugs like Supplicate to get them off faster and sooner instead of the slow process of methadone. Okay, um, the next one is on the city's debt servicing. So the city is uh, currently hundreds of millions of dollars in debt that is projected to grow over the next few years. Um, what would you do about debt servicing? And Jerry, you're up. Thank you very much. So it starts out with uh, going through our budget line by line. So when council gets together, we need to look at our budget and we need to review those budgets. And I've done this before, big corporations, and you have multiple departments often spending money on similar things. So you know, engineering's got a marketing budget and, and uh, planning's got a marketing budget. Somebody else has a marketing budget. But if you look at those marketing budgets and individual pieces, it doesn't look so bad. And when you total them all up, it's a staggering number. And so, you know, the, at the County Simple, we save hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure the marketing department manages the marketing needs of all, all departments saving those type of dollars. And that money goes right on to the debt. And so we need to pay it down. And what happens at the end of every council tour, every year, you know, cities end up with a surplus. And everybody wants to do something to fund with the surplus, right? We want to fund the park, and we want to do something that we can show up cut a cake, cut a ribbon, and, and get some uh, photos that everybody's really happy. We need to be more sobering than that, more clear than that. If we have tens of millions of dollars, which is not a big savings when you have a 500 or 600 million dollar budget, to see us with a seven or 10 million dollar surplus, you take that surplus and you put it onto the debt. And it's very clear, our debt yesterday was 500 million, I just put 10 million on it, my debt now today is 490 million. There's no smoke and mirrors, people can understand simple conversations. So we have to manage the overall spending of the city to drive down that debt, because that debt can't go up, we can't afford for it to go up. And we have to manage it, but we have to manage it from all aspects of how we spend our money. And when we have a surplus, look at that as not frivolous money. Look at that as serious money that should be put against a serious debt. Thank you. Uh, look, I think that uh, I think Jerry's on the right, right path there. You know, surplus should be uh, going to retiring debt. I also think that um, when we're looking as, at the, the plans for the city going forward, uh, the capital surcharge the city has, I think is a, a, a good thing to have. It pays for the infrastructure. And I would continue with that as mayor. But I'd also look at zero-based budgeting throughout city hall. You know, I was looking at other municipality, and what they experienced was uh, when they shut down spending in the final month of the year, that they had a 20% reduction. <laughs> Can you imagine that? So we need to take a look at taking some of those steps where we can actually uh, find the savings. 
and, and we shouldn't be having uh, a situation where staff are dictating what's happening by the last end of the month or end of the year spends so that they can justify budgets for future years. You know, the other thing that I think is incredibly important is to recognize that last October there was a, uh, a report that came forward to look at the next 10 years. And the next 10 years, every councillor, or most if not every, said, you know, I can't believe how much debt we're about to take on. And then what did we do in January, February, March? We added $300 million of new spending on top of that over the next decade. We need to be serious about this, right? We need to sit down and look and go, what can we afford? Right? What are we able to complete these things? The other item that I think is really important is to look at our past and learn the lessons. The wastewater plant and the water plant, we put huge investments in upwards of a half a billion dollars overall. You ask yourself, why are our water and wastewater rates going up so heavily? Right? Everyone knows that, everyone sees it. It's almost another mortgage payment between that and taxes. And the answer is because we've made all of these uh, infrastructure improvements already, but we haven't had the customer base servicing. By servicing lands outside of Barrie to our member municipalities around us, creating jobs, we can help them help us share the burden. Thank you. Okay, I've got a bit of a different take on it. So we have about a $300 million northwards of $300 million debt in the city right now. It's Most of it is for two projects, the water treatment, surface water treatment plant and the wastewater plant. And both of them, the money went into those to expand those plants to take care of growth. And in case of the wastewater plant, it also goes to improving the water quality that's leaving that plant, which improves the water quality in Kempfell Bay. That, those were built for future growth. They're gonna be paid, that debt is gonna be paid by future growth. Development charges on future growth. Almost all that debt is gonna be paid by future residents, which is the way it should be. The alternative would be to have current residents pay for the debt, that for the things that future residents are gonna enjoy. So I'm actually not sure if I want to see surpluses that are paid by current residents go towards reducing the debt that future residents are going to be paying. So, I mean, that doesn't mean we have to be careful. We shouldn't be adding to the debt, but it's all for capital costs for future residents. We're not using, we're not borrowing, we're not going into debt to cover operating costs. So uh, and a lot of that debt was taken at very, very low, historically low interest rates, and that's not five-year five -year terms. I mean, that's the rate that's going to be paid over 30 years very low terms. I think it's actually a great deal. I know it's scary to think we've got that debt, but it's going to be paid by the charges on new homes and new businesses that come to Barry. Thank you. That was a great answer, Barry. I love that. I, I don't want to use cliches, you know, like trimming the fat, but there's a lot of businesses out there, large businesses. They're making huge profits, billions of dollars quarterly, annually. Banks are making money through your investments, through your taxes. Why do we have to continue paying to make them rich and we have to continue paying for our communities? Why can't these businesses that are coming into our community contribute more, pay more taxes? Why do we have to fund everything when we're making them rich? Why can't we dig into that and see why don't they help our communities out a little more instead of just having you know their, their little fundraisers and, and putting the little coin box in the, in the bank and uh, you know donate for the children's charities. You know, it's like they're making billions and we're, we're giving them the money to invest and, and we're getting very little back and we're expected to pay for everything while they're getting rich. Doesn't make sense to me. Let's look into that. Okay. Um, this is an issue that has uh, come up at council pretty recently. Do you support Bill 5 and does it go far enough? So, Alex, you get the first crack at this one. I think we'll be really quick on this one. The answer is yes, I do. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, I think that, that, that what we're looking at uh, a, a, you know, harassment in the workplace is everyone deserves a place that they are able to uh, get their work done to, uh, you know, ensure that it's, it's safe for them, safe for members of the public, safe for members of the community, safe for members uh, of staff. And um, so without a doubt, that would be a yes. The other, the other thing I think that we need to, to really dialogue on, and, and quite frankly, uh, it came into uh, today's debate, is ensuring that the dialogue between uh, members of, of staff or members of the council and the public is always uh, maintained in a way that doesn't uh, promote uh, harassment. And um, I think uh, at, at this point, I'd like to, to thank Gage Barry for, uh, and, and CARP for uh, the decisions they made over the last uh, 48 hours. Uh, leadership is not an 
Veterans Resolution is supporting it, so it's pretty obvious how I feel. Um, I can agree completely. Nobody should feel threatened at work. And in fact, I um, I can say I took the lead when there was a case of it that came up in the last council. I'm the one that took the lead in trying to hold the councillor accountable. We did it to some degree, but maybe not to everybody's satisfaction, not to my satisfaction. But uh, I think my record speaks for itself. Thank you. So the answer is 100 percent yes. Uh, you know, and harassment uh, between staff and council members, you know, it's not unique to the city of Erie. You see it all over the uh, province of Ontario as you watch uh, different councils. You know, we have a situation uh, a couple years back where the uh, mayor from uh, from Sarnia was actually removed from city hall by his council, saying, "No, the way you're treating staff is not acceptable." And they actually physically had him in an office that was separate from city hall. The only time you could come to City Hall was actually for council meetings. So, you know, that council took aggressive action on their own right up front. And so you can take action on your own. You can be uh, uh, more forceful as a council to enforce those rules. But certainly Bill 5 is, is part of it, but it's accountability by each member of council as well. You know, we're going to have moments of disagreement, but we have to have those moments in an agreeable manner. It's okay to have a different opinion, but it's okay in a different opinion with staff. But you got to make sure how you express those opinions and how you challenge staff during the meeting. Because staff may have a report, you might not like something on that report. But you have to ask that question in a professional manner. So when you push back on maybe a proposal or a recommendation that you don't like, you need to be respectful and you need to choose words carefully so that you know everybody in the room feels comfortable having a conversation. And being uncomfortable in City Hall is just something that shouldn't happen. Okay, now the lightning round. No. Um, if, if it's okay, we're just going to take a brief five minute break um, and uh, we'll just kind of reset. I'll come back and do some more questions after that. Oh. This next question, um, no, I'm not sure if you guys are going to talk to me after this one. All right. Uh, so, a candidate who was invited today has been accused of harassment and charged with a DUI while in office. Another has been complacent and has yet to condemn those actions publicly. Another was recently arrested in Aurelia. And another has promoted gun violence as a means to ending an indigenous blockade. Another, as warden, allowed homelessness to climb to historic levels. None of these are trustworthy actions, why should we trust you now? <laughs> uh, well, it is actually, it is, it is Barry's uh, okay. turn to go first. You will get your say, don't worry. Um, yeah, he's gonna get it pretty quickly, actually, because I'm trying, I, I am not gonna comment on anything about my other candidate, so I respect the, uh, the process, and uh, I, well, then it's all yours. Uh, I briefly spoke about this before, I have a minute and a half now. Uh, I was invited by the mothers, the grandmothers, and some children. Uh, I have been protesting. These experimental vaccines have not been fully approved. They were for emergency use only. Parents out there have been concerned because they're afraid for the children. There's been a lot of side effects happening. This was over the fact that they were opening up the site in Aurelia at the hospital and injecting six-month-old babies. I'd like to err on the side of caution. I think we need to protect our children. I will go to jail again. I will be arrested again. I think these things need to be looked at. I think they need to be halted. Doctors around the world have been raising awareness that these are not working. And, and, and there's countries like Finland have stopped giving the vaccines for people under the age of 50. Unless you're at high risk, our children have amazing immune systems they are not at risk our elderly our sick and our frail are i'm sorry i will fight for our children i will go to jail that is why i was arrested and i'll do it again the 
thank you. I won't uh, speak to the other candidates, but if I look left and I look right, I think I'm the only warden in the room, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so I will speak to that. So, so as the warden, uh, you know, I, I took great pride in our, our efforts there as the warden. We actually had a great affordable housing committee. Uh, we committed to building 2,685 affordable housing units in, in a 10-year period. And what we did beyond that is the work. I went to all 18 municipalities in the county of Central, including the city of Barrie, and we gave them the homeless report. We told them what the targets were in each one of those centers, and I showed up two years later and told them where we were at and what we needed to do. Uh, beyond that, we also recognized from the affordable housing that our original plan at the county was, was flawed a little bit in, the, in our criteria. The criteria said you had to be in a bus road, or you had to be close to this, you had to be close to that. What meant the small hamlets, like Victoria Harbor, Coldwater, some of those other smaller communities didn't have a program, so we invested another $2 million to make sure our smaller hamlets and villages had accommodations for, for the homeless. And I'm quite proud after that, uh, as I retired from Warden, I, was, I got to work with my son, Steve, and we turned uh, our shipping containers into affordable housing units and have it done it across the province of Ontario, providing another safe haven for those who are homeless to live and play and work. So. Um, Anyways, we did our best. I'm pretty proud of my record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, I think there was a number of issues uh, brought up in that. I think I want to take the opportunity to talk about those. You know, uh, homelessness, I don't think there's a person on stage here uh, who doesn't want to do everything they can to help uh, the homeless here in, in the city of Barrie, not just the city of Barrie, all around. Right? Because we're, we're, we're a geographic center. And the reality is that means folks from all around the communities, they'll come here. They'll look for services, they'll look for opportunities, but maybe it's housing they're looking for, shelter. And the reality is I know that all the people on this stage want to do the best thing for those folks. When it comes to the Indigenous community, you know, yesterday I had the opportunity to go down to, uh, to the Spirit Catcher and Truth and Reconciliation Day. And you know, one of the neat things that uh, I've been able to participate in over the years and help start was something called Pi Education. Talked about it earlier. Pi Education gives backpacks to every child in government housing, but it also gave backpacks to children on First Nations. It's Christian Island, Moe's Lake, Wauteau Mohawk up in Muskoka. You know, there's lots of opportunities us for us to do better with the Indigenous community here in Barrie to work with the Native Friendship Center to make sure that, that, that we're providing every opportunity possible. And when it comes to City Hall, I've been very clear, and I'll be clear every single day that I'm mayor of the city of Barrie. It is a place that needs to be free of harassment, especially sexual harassment. And there won't be any hiding from it for six or eight or 12 months or 24 months. It'll be immediate. Because you know what? If my daughter wants to work in that place one day, it better be safe for her to do so. Thank you. here, so I'm going to say that this is probably going to end up being the last question that we're going to get in today. Uh, it is about remote work. Considering remote work is becoming more commonplace, how do you think this will impact creating and drawing well-paying jobs to Barry and well in Europe? I would love to work remote. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, a lot of driving. It's, it's not the best the environment. It's not the best, you know, in my pocket for paying for gas. Um, I, I think that, that people like working from home, but you know they also need to keep you know, social. We need to get out there and we need to, to integrate and, and, and speak amongst each other. Um, I, 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 if it works and it saves money and it saves on gas, but you know we just got to make sure that these people don't stay at home and you know um, get uh, cabin fever kind of a thing. You know, I think it's a great idea. I don't really understand what the is there an issue with the question or like. Well, I think it's about, um, since people are, are working remotely, how you're going to um, continue to attract those jobs to Barry. Well, I mean, there's a lot of outsourcing going on. You know, they're sending stuff off to India and other countries, and we're, we're getting, you know, phone calls from them, and we're dealing with people from that, that don't even live in Barry. So out, outsourcing could take away a lot of the local jobs, but seconds. It, it could also create jobs. I don't, I don't even know. I can't answer that one because uh, people want to work from home, they're going to work from home, and if they can make money from home, all to it. But we, we need to make jobs in Barry, whether or not they're remote or in a factory or, or, or promoting somebody's own business. Well, 
That's a great question. And so what we need to do is, is sell the city of Barrie. So if you get to work remote, why would you work anywhere other than the city of Barrie? Why would we not promote it? Live, work, and play in Barrie. I mean, we have great assets. We're a wonderful city. We've got a great waterfront. We're viable. We're, we're vibrant. We're all the things that you want to do to live, work, and play. And so when, when I look at these opportunities, when they have these type of questions is, yes, the main business might be somewhere else in the world. But if that employee can live, work, and play in the city of Barrie, we need to encourage that. And when I look at things uh, such as, you know, I, I had a post uh, the other day on social media about, you know, getting our Wi-Fi into our parks and into our downtown cores. And that's all about people working from home. So to Weldon's point, you don't want to be locked in that house 724, 365. So on a nice sunny day, could you not go down to the park in downtown and sit there with your laptop, have a cup of coffee, and enjoy the environment and connect to work? There's no reason you can't do those things. And, uh, you know, one of my jobs as the, uh, uh, the chair of the Western Wardens was we had underserved areas all over, you know, the Western Wardens are 320 communities from Barrie to Windsor. And a lot of those had underserved internet services. So, you know, we went and I pursued, it took me about 22 months, but I finally got the provincial and federal governments to cough up $190 million so we could drive fiber networks into those underserved areas to make sure that people could connect to the network. And so where we're weak in, in, in place, Places in Barrie where we don't have good internet services, we have to stay on top of that and get funding for that, and drive that connectivity to every corner of the city of Barrie so that we can embrace working from home. Thank you. So, uh, so I'm of two minds on this, and, and, and Jerry uh, did work uh, as uh, as a uh, warden and uh, with Swift is the name of the program. And, where he, uh, where he was able to, uh, to do some work lobbying. I know that uh, it took lots of members of the provincial and federal parliament. It took lots of uh, members of, of council around the region to, uh, to continually put pressure on. And that funding came, it came after Eastern Ontario received, called EOR, believe it or not, uh, received an incredible amount of funding. But about two lines because of this, my business is fiber optics. We go in and we build fiber optic networks and the more people who work from home, uh, the more business we get to do. But the reality is what we're seeing right now is that folks are getting called back to work. And if you speak to the banks or speak to uh, different companies in downtown Toronto, if you have friends who, who work there, they're being called back. The remote workplace is uh, not lasting at this point. And so uh, I think it's twofold. Number one, uh, we need to make sure, as, as Jerry just said, that we have the internet infrastructure here in the city of Barrie. Rogers is investing right on my street. One of the things that I'll commend the city for right now is that they're doing the sewers, they're doing the, the water, they're doing the road. The hydro is in, uh, is in there as well. And Rogers came to do the internet at the same time. I've never seen it actually happen all at the same time before, which is a good move. So we need to do that. But we also need to make sure that we have jobs here in Barrie, and we're not just relying on new highways being built in Toronto. We need to make sure folks can work here in Barrie, whether it's remotely or in a workplace, and, and that's what I'm gonna work towards uh, as your mayor. Okay, I'm, uh, I've got a bit of a bias here because I do work remotely. I love working remotely, and I think it's something that, you know, you're right, some people will be called back. I am never going to be called back to my office. It is actually closed. <laughs> Everybody that works for the city, for Post Media, which I do, works remotely now, and I think it's great. Um, I thoroughly enjoy it, and I think it is the way of the future for a lot of people, and I think it makes it more important than ever that we make very a great place to live because people will be able to live anywhere. Yeah. So if they have a choice of where they live, we better have a great city. We better have great restaurants. We better have a great downtown. We better have a lots of housing um, um, options. We have to have great parks. We have to have great recreation facilities because people will be able to live where they want when they're working remotely. And if we want them to work in Barry and live in Barry, we better make it keep it a great place to live. So thank you. For your company picnic, do you guys just have to go to the fridge or Surprise question that just ends this nicely. 
Um, listen, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, it's been a, my pleasure to be here uh, to uh, you know, answer some questions and give my insight and some, some of my thoughts and different ideas on how the city looks and feels and, and where we go. I hope that my comments on the leadership uh, resonate with you. I've gotten the background, I've got the experience from uh, previous uh, roles in politics and my corporate experience that I bring to the table. Um, you know, so I just simply leave you with this. So my brochure is there. It's got the high level details on the back. There's a resume attached and the website's got the really good stuff. Thanks for coming up. I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Chris for uh, moderating today. You did an excellent job. I, I say that in faith because there's a couple more things to go here. Uh, but uh, I also just want to thank all of you for coming out because obviously a citizen engagement is key to, uh, to a community and to a city. And uh, I think it's uh, incredible we've had the opportunity today uh, Gwen uh, from CARP, uh, Engage Mary, and um, obviously the Salvation Army, which is uh, an incredible organization uh, that does an incredible amount of work for uh, the whole of the city of Mary, as well as uh, at Christmas time. It's always a lot of fun to jump on, uh, on and help with fundraising there. So just want to say thank you to everyone for coming today, and, and if uh, you have any questions for me afterwards, feel free to, to come up and ask. Please, 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 please vote.